Hi everyone, this is Matt from the Teflology podcast. At this year's JOUT PANSIG conference, we were invited to host and conduct the plenary sessions. In a similar way to recent PANSIG conferences, the plenary sessions were interactive, with this year's sessions being conducted as interviews. Today we are delighted to be bringing you the first of the three plenary interviews. The first plenary interviewee is Professor Xu Ming Thang, interviewed by Robert Lowe. Dr. Xu Ming Thang is a professor at the Faculty of Education and Languages at HELP University, Kuala Lumpur. Her key areas of interest are learner autonomy, computer-assisted language learning, learning styles and strategies, motivation studies, and eye movement research. In this interview, Rob asked questions to Xu Ming about some of these topics, with additional questions from the audience following. So, we hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you for agreeing to this session. Um, I wonder if you could begin by telling us a little about your educational and professional background. Education background, uh, I did my first degree in the University of Malaya and it was in literature. Then uh, my second degree was on English language studies and uh, TESOL. And uh, actually the third degree is education at the University of Nottingham. Uh, I covered three fields because I felt that when I finished my English language studies, I felt that I need to be more uh, um, more involved in the uh, education per, uh, perspective, and that was why I decided to do my PhD in education, and it was on autonomy, learning strategies, and distance education. And professional development, actually I have been uh, attached to the University of Bangsa, Malaysia, which is the National University of Malaysia, for almost 30 years, and uh, retired recently. I uh, enjoyed myself for two years traveling around, having a wonderful time. Then I decided maybe I should use my brain a little bit more. So I joined a private university, which is Hart University. It's very challenging and very different because a public university is definitely very different from private university. I'm sure you all know. Their the perspective of things and their view of things are very different. So I'm just learning. I've been there less than two months. So I can't tell you that much yet. Okay. Um, so you mentioned a few different areas that you've studied, um, but your work has focused on the use of technology in the classroom. Um, how did you become interested in that area specifically? Well, actually it started back in 2002 when I was still very young and very green and I attended the first Air Asia Call conference. And that was my first exposure to technology and I thought, wow, this is nice and there are so many things that I can learn from here. And I met many experts and very nice people, and I said this is the area to go to because the people are very nice and very helpful, and they asked me to be part of the community. And so I joined the community, and from that I become more involved in call. And because of uh, involvement with people who have so much knowledge, I also start experimenting with the use of technology in my classroom. And uh, at time, it was very... Uh, I would say it, uh, enjoyable and I learned a lot from that and other times it was very discouraging and frustrating and that was why I started to investigate why, what's the problem. Mm. Okay, um, and your research has included the use of ICT in both formal and informal learning environments. Um, how does the use of ICT differ between those two environments? Well, when, when I talk about former, I talk more about the classroom situation, what happens in the classroom. When you use ICT, that is uh, using laptops, computers, and uh, in the Malaysian context, it's not possible to use mobile phones because students are not supposed to bring mobile phones to school. They are not allowed to bring mobile phones. So it was not possible to use the technology in classroom. In formal situation, I'm talking about teacher giving students activities whereby they can go home and they can use all the resources they can find online. They can also use their mobile phones and they use other types of technologies to help them to actually learn through the uh, ICT. So I would feel I feel that the informal learning method is better. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and you've focused a little on some of the challenges uh, facing implementing technologies in Asia, particularly in Malaysia. Um, 
Could you uh, explain some of those challenges? Yeah, as I as was saying that uh, I was very involved in the use of technologies and I tried out on my students in the university and I carried out studies in secondary schools on the use of technologies. I interviewed lecturers and teachers in schools to find out to what extent they use technology. And then I realized that, uh, well, we all think that technology is good and we encourage the teachers to use technologies. But when you talk to the teachers in the school, you feel that many of them do not bother, okay? One thing, the teacher feel that they are doing a good job already. They're teaching very well. Why are you making my life difficult? They're asking me to use technologies. And they feel that technologies means a lot of preparation, which means a lot of work. They have to prepare the class before they go in, and they're using tools that they are not familiar with. And one main, uh, point that they bring out is the students know technology better than me. So if I use technology, I think I feel like I'm a student and they are the teachers. So they feel inferior and because of that, they, they are not very happy about using technology. In fact, when I first introduced digital storytelling to the staff members of my university, and being the head of the school, I insisted everybody use it. And they were very upset with me and they said, I'm doing a good job, why are you forcing me to use this technology? So I say, this is good for you. And they said, we don't know how to use it, you have to send people to train us. So I have to have a whole group of people sent to each teacher's class to teach the teacher as well as to the student how to use the technology. Basically, it was teaching the teacher more than the students because the students pick it up very fast. Very fast they learned it, but the teacher still lost. So when the feedback came back from interviewing the students, they said, my teacher doesn't know what is going on, you know. My teachers just stand there and look at us and see what we're doing. And when we ask them, they say, never mind, do whatever you want. Or they will look for some technical uh, support staff to come in. So it was quite chaotic in the first semester. Everybody was not happy. The teachers were very angry with me. And they say that we were, I was trying to make their life difficult. But getting the feedback from the students helped because the students show that they enjoy it and the teachers actually, in the end, when they came back with a post report, they said, yeah, my students actually enjoy it and I, I, I think I know how to do it now. So the following semester was much more smoother. The teachers actually now know the technology a little bit better. So I think that is the main problem of introducing technology, getting the teacher to be part of it. And, uh, well, for my case, because I was the head of school, I can say everybody do it. But if you're not the head of school, it's very difficult to make the teachers do it, you know. They, they, they refuse. They, they will say, no, why should I do it? And they, they, they complain about the fact that they're being inferior because the students know better. So that, that is one of the challenges. In the context of the students, they are very willing to take on technology. As long as you introduce to them, they would use it. But unfortunately, after they leave the uh, classroom and you ask them two years later, do you do what I ask you to do, the blogging, etc., going online, search for resources? They look at you strangely and say, well, that was for class, right? Uh, I'm out of class now, so, so that, that is the problem. And of course, uh, the third one, very important, is the support system in the university. Well, that, that is a very long story. Do I have time to tell the story or is it? I think we have time. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. The, the story is uh, way back in 1999, we introduced Smart School. And the purpose of Smart School was to get the teachers uh, to learn technology. So it's creating a knowledge, uh, knowledge society, critical learner, autonomous learner, etc. All those big, big words came out. And the government came up and used a lot of million, uh, million, lots of money to come up with this training program. And it started with 20 to 30 smart schools who were given all the necessary ICT technology stuff and then they were supposed to uh, ask the teachers to go for training. And it was supposed to be a cascading process whereby these teachers were learn, And then these teachers are supposed to impart the knowledge to other schools. And from there, it's supposed to go through the whole of Malaysia, disseminate to everybody, and everybody becomes very techno-savvy and everybody uses technology. But of course, with many big ideas, it always ends with being an idea only. And uh, it never goes beyond that 30 schools. And after that, I follow up with post-interview and ask the teachers, and many of the teachers who use it, uh, who are in the smart schools, 
told me that oh, we, we went to the classes and we really didn't listen much and they explained not so clearly. So how do I go back and teach people, etc. So in the end, that project failed in the sense that uh, lots of money was wasted and even the computers in the smart schools now are all getting very old and spoiled and then the government doesn't have money to, to go to other schools to provide more computers. So that is failure number one. Following that, they, th they thought, oh, maybe we get the private sectors involved and get them to help us. And so uh, some private companies, I shall not name them, uh, provided some computers, etc., to various schools. On, in, in fact, it was supposed to be uh, the government subscribed to their uh, Wi-Fi service, everything, and they would provide the technology. Well, unfortunately, it didn't work. So, so things like that are also very discouraging for the teachers. Up to today, you'll find that many schools do not have computer. But of course, I want to point out the fact that there is a big spectrum. The private schools have more facilities. They have all the resources, they have the money to install the computers. But the pu public schools do not have, especially those in the ruler. Probably if you go to the ruler schools, you don't even see one computer. And if there is one, it's already half broken or something like that. So, so that type of thing. And mobile phones, of course, in the private schools, all the students have mobile phones. In the rural school, it's not so much as the mobile phone, it's the Wi-Fi, it's not there, everything is not there. So it is very difficult. So, okay, so the three main factors is the teacher factor, the students factors, and the support factors. But I think the human factor is more important than anything else. And I think I'll explain that later much, why the human factor is more important. Facilities, because facilities you can provide, but human beings, their mind is not easy to change. So you mentioned um, the government uh, attempting to kind of roll out this kind of uh, training around the mm -hmm. country. Um, so there have been similar, um, I guess, issues with um, the, the rollout of any kind of educational technology, you know, with CLT and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, is there any difference between um, the, the spreading of educational technology more generally and technology in the sense that you're talking about? Well, what I'm talking is about uh, technology per se, mm. but of course it's related to education because the, the fact is that they're using the technology to help <laughs> students to learn better. Mm. So I would say that to the government, it's the same thing. Right. And to the government, the, uh, having all these computers, everything, were to create a knowledge society, a society where people learn autonomously, when the teachers are critical, the teachers can use the computer to teach the student, and to, in, at the end, come up with lifelong learner. And that was the final goal. Mm. So I don't think there is a, a difference as far as the government is concerned. OK, OK. Mm -mm. Um, and you also talked about um, students uh, having different levels of um, kind of technological awareness, I guess. Yes, yes. Um, so one thing that we find in Japan, or that I find, I'm, I'm not sure about everyone else, is that um, the students uh, tend to be very kind of smartphone literate. Um, they're very good at using their smartphones, but in terms of the kind of technology we want them to use in the classroom or, mm -hmm. you know, to do their homework... They, they tend not to be quite so computer literate. Yeah. Do you find the same problem in Malaysia? Well, I would say that the students in the urban areas, they are very familiar with technologies, but they tend to use it for gaming, for recreational and entertaining purposes. They do not, I mean, let's say if you give them an English homework, I don't expect them, or they would not really go into the internet and start searching methods of how to learn English, learn those things that I ask them to do. So they, they actually separate that. Learning is classroom. Learning is with the teacher's instruction. Whereas fun is entertainment, is with the computer, etc. But if you're talking about the rural areas, well, unfortunately, some of them don't even have mobile phones. And if they're mobile phones, they're very simple phones. So I don't think they have the Wi-Fi facilities to indulge in all the games, etc. So in that sense, maybe Japan, Japan is better in the sense that almost everybody has a mobile phone and they are very uh, f uh, smartphone illiterate. In Malaysia, smartphone is limited to various parts of the country. Not all the uh, students have, though they have a compute, uh, mobile phones for communication. Mm. Okay. Um, and uh, so you... you kind of mentioned there that um, the students use technology for entertainment but not for learning. 
Why, why not? Why do you think that's the case? Well, they, they would learn, uh, use technology for learning. Uh, okay, when I started introducing technologies in the classroom, I was hoping that I teach you how these technologies and I expose to them and I actually say that you can use this for learning what. And I was expecting that after I talked to them, no, when I talked to them one year later, that they'll be using all these tools to improve the English. But to them, those technologies are only for classroom. Those technologies are only when the teacher asks me to do. But out of the classroom, I don't. And I gather it's also the fun factor, right, of a fun factor. Uh, but I think there's a disadvantage about educational games. Educational tools and programs, they are not interesting enough to engage the students, right? And if you find it too entertaining, the education value is lost. Mm. So I mean, but. Nowadays, there are lots of games that actually people say can use for uh, education as well. I think that if you can incorporate the two together, then you can get students to actually use the games to learn. Mm. So you said the games aren't interesting enough, or educational technology isn't interesting enough. Um, do you think that uh, even if you made the technology very interesting, students might still reject it on the basis that it is educational? <laughs> well... I, I've seen the games that my sons plays, and I feel that uh, those are more interesting definitely than education games. I mm. haven't come across one education game that is more interesting than the games that they play. Right. So I, I think, well, maybe some people can correct me because I'm not very good in gaming. Some people who are experts in gaming maybe say, I'm sorry, you're wrong. I have a game that is super good. Well, please share with us. We would love to hear about that. Mm. Okay. Um, and you've noted that the so-called uh, digital natives in Malaysia, um, so the, the, the quote you used was, they make neither extensive nor diverse use of technology. Is that the same thing that you're talking about there? Well, of course, the concept of digital native has always been uh, debated, and Pransky's uh, definition has been people say there's no such thing as digital natives. And uh, the terms of differential migration and all that type of thing has always been an issue that uh, nobody really agrees on, definitely. In the case of Malaysia, I would say students in the urban area, I would consider them as being digital natives because by three years old, the parents are so busy and they don't have time to take care of children, they throw a computer or uh, something like I, I see two or three years old playing with the computers and all those type of things. So I gather by the time they reach seven or eight, they be quite digital natives, right? They, they're using a lot of computers and little tablets and everything to play games and all, all sorts of things to entertain them. I'm not saying that it's a good thing, okay? <laughs> I think children should have more diverse entertainment than that. So in that sense, Malaysia children nowadays are very exposed to uh, technology, especially in the urban areas. So if your question is whether you consider them as digital native, is it? Well, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, I think they are digital natives in the sense they, they are brought up with the technology. Mm. Mm -hmm. And is it the same in Japan? Do they, do they use uh, children plays a lot of computer games when they're very young. I think so too, right? I think so, yes. yes yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. Mm. And when they're older as well. <laughs> and adults. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so in terms of that phrase, um, they make neither extensive nor diverse use of the technology. Um, so I guess that's, that's kind of what you're talking about. They, they will use it for, you know, kind of entertainment yeah, purposes, yeah. but not for... Yeah like language learning, the informal yes, yes, learning environments yes, yes. outside the classroom. In fact, when this uh, virtual reality was introduced, Avatar thing, I thought the students would be very interested to use it mm. uh, for education purpose because it's, it's like a journey and uh, they, have a, they take on a new personality. But surprisingly, no, you know, because mm. we introduce it and the students find it very boring moving right. from what... And the tasks that they're supposed to do, they find it not challenging, they find it very... Has, um, having to go from point A to point B, doing very little uh, tasks and all that type of thing. So, mm. okay, that's how I feel. Right, right, right. So what would you recommend um, in terms of overcoming this issue of, of students just not making use of the uh, educational technology available? Or, or how could educational technology be changed um, to make it more uh, interesting, more enjoyable for students? Well, I think that, that should be a question addressed to people who design computers, uh, softwares and uh, games, etc. As, as, as far as I'm concerned, I feel that, uh, for example, there are lots of computer games that attract students and uh, they spend almost 
not hours, but days sitting there, actually. So if those things can, those elements can be actually imported into educational games, that'd be wonderful, isn't it? Then the students will be sitting there. But then I was wondering too, because I, look at, I was looking at some of the education games, how can you incorporate all these elements into the educational games? That is the difficult part. Okay, in the sense of classroom, uh, for example, you introduce some education technologies to your class students and you want them to use them to learn as they progressively move from year one to year two and year three. I really don't know how to do it because I say that the only way I could uh, actually get it done when I was here at school was I say that, okay, every year, every semester, teachers have to have this in your course so that the students will get to be familiar with it and they will sort of think, oh, say, this is something that I should follow up as I go along in life. Mm. So beyond that, uh, I really don't know how else to do it because they don't really see that educational games and uh, studies, uh, sorry, entertainment is the same. Mm. They do not see the two as being the same thing. Right, right. Well, that's kind of what I was asking earlier, whether students might reject games, even very interesting and well-designed games, if they thought that they were being, you know, tricked into doing some education? Well, they don't mind being tricked, but the thing is, <laughs> they, they don't mind being tricked if you make it a class uh, action. In fact, they'll be quite... But the thing is, how exciting can you make it? Can it be as exciting as the real games? Mm. Okay? So you cannot make it as exciting as the real game. So they, they don't mind being tricked in the classroom. They don't mind being tricked when you say this is an assignment and you get marks for it, especially in Malaysian context, marks are very important. Mm. So you say you get marks for it, you get scores for it. They would do all the games and they would enjoy doing it. But then after they leave it, they say, okay, would you choose A, that is educational game, B, games for fun? They would choose B. Mm. Uh, right. So, so, so that, that is the mindset that we cannot move that away mm. from. Right, right, right. Students just don't like learning, for the most part. <laughs> their, their perspective of fun, I think, is different from our perspective of fun, because for us, fun means increasing your knowledge. Mm. For them, I get it, fun means fun, fun, just stop that, right? But they do in increase the knowledge, but knowledge not in the language or knowledge in the uh, subject field, but mm. knowledge in other ways, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I see. So maybe tricking is the way forward. <laughs> So uh, you, you mentioned that virtual... But tricking them is a good idea, I think. Mm. Uh, <laughs> tricking them is a good idea if you come up with games that they're so excited that they are, they'll be tricked for life, right? Mm. Yes, yes, yes. If you can come up, then they get addicted to those games, that'd be fine. Mm. Well, that leads me on to the next question, actually. Um, so can you suggest some innovative language learning environments appropriate for the Southeast Asian context? Well, that, that is a tough question. Southeast Asia context, innovative learning environments. In fact, if you look online, you'll find that there are lots and lots of games, right? Uh, it comes back to the same question, what, what do you mean by innovative learning environment? Mm. So to you, it's an innovative learning environment. To them, it's not an innovative environment. I started to introduce MOOC MOOC to the students. I say that there are lots of things that you can learn, you know, and you can sign up for MOOC course, and they look at me with the eyes big, big. And... Uh, they say the MOOC courses are not uh, entertaining, not enjoyable. Mm. Well, some of the MOOC courses are really boring. I sang up a field and I dropped out, I have to say. But uh, how to make the MOOC courses so engaging that the students would like to sign up? So, and there are lots of online activities that they can do. But if you say it, innovative environment for the students, I think it has to be the teacher creating the innovative environment. And before, the teacher can do it. The teacher has to buy into the concept that technology is good for the students and also good for them. It just doesn't mean just good, a lot of work for them. So if they can buy in, like for example, when I introduced the digital story, the teacher buy in. For the first semester, they were so against it, okay? They were very angry with me. In fact, they glare at me when they see me and they send me little, little nasty notes. But the second semester, they sort of get the hang of it and they enjoy it and they find that, oh, maybe I should investigate doing it. So creating innovative environment in the Malaysian context because students believe that the teacher 
uh, teacher should be in charge. Teacher is the, they, they are very teacher centered. So if the teacher can start creating innovative learning environment, I say in the classrooms, and sending the, giving the students activities they can do outside the classroom that is interesting and innovative, then the students will start being interested. Mm. And of course, I always feel that, let's say, for example, you can ask the students to go back, which I did. I say, okay, you, you go and look online and for games that you think is interesting, and then you do that as a project, and that will be your assignment. I, I don't care what, what uh, online tools you choose, but as long as you make it into an assignment that is interesting, you present it. So I think those are the things where actually it is semi. It's not the students in charge 100%. There is some control, half, and autonomy as well as every and if the teachers say that you can go back and do it of course the teacher says that if I let the students go and do on their own they come up with some strange thing I don't understand they also worry about that mm. so I say it's all right you should see a supportive you tell your students okay I'm not sure how to do this maybe you can teach me in the process you learn as well mm. so that, that that type of environment I think will be good teacher right. students collaboration mm. But you also mentioned that some teachers might feel kind of threatened at having a lower knowledge level than their yes, students. Yes, yes, yes. Um, how, how can you reconcile that with the idea of teacher student well, collaboration? Well, as I say, the only way is to force them to do it for one semester. Right. In my university, the public university, they insist that you must use the materials on the online platform. Mm. So if you start by doing it for one semester, then the teacher get a hang of it. Then they start becoming very interested and mm. the collaboration comes in. In the Malaysian sense, I think you have to do force, paksa, force them first. And then after that, they sort of buy in. Right, right, right. But in the school, it's very difficult to do that. Mm. Because the, sometimes the buy-in has to be the headmaster. The headmaster thinks that you're wasting time, you're coming in and make my teachers play games. No, 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 I'm not interested in that. My teachers have to teach, teach, teach and get the students to pass exam. Mm. So that is a tough one. Okay, uh, yeah. And um, so maybe uh, for, for one kind of uh, final topic, um, so there are some teachers, uh, and I, I'm assuming some people in this room, who may now have, uh, based on what you've said, bought into the idea of using technology in the classroom, um, but they're not maybe sure how to go about it, and I'd include myself in that category. Um, so do you have any advice for teachers who are hoping to integrate technology more into their classes? Well, actually, uh, well, I don't know what stage you are actually uh, targeting me. Let's say if you're very green, but you don't know anything, you probably don't want to go in. So probably after attending some of these courses or meeting all these people here, then I think consulting some of them and asking them for advice as how do I use that was how I still I started using technology in 2002. I was really green. So I went there and I look at it, I said, wow, wow, wow. And I was very excited. So I get the context of these people. I say, I would like to use this technology in my classroom. Would you recommend... Uh, what's the best way to do it? And then he said, yeah, you can work with me and I will teach you how to use it. And then I start setting up the things. So I think one way is, of course, to attend conferences like that and also little workshops whereby you get people who are interested to share with you to actually teach you how to do it. And then from there, you become more confident. When you become more confident, there are lots of resources online. So much that you don't know where to stop. Mm. You see? So there are lots of resources that you can go online because you know how to search for it. But I would think that platform like this is brilliant for teachers to come and learn how to use resources because I'm sure everybody here is so willing to share, right? Yes, share their knowledge <laughs> about technology. And uh, that was how I learned. I met some very nice people who actually share methods of how to use different technologies, tools, and simple. Even la first time I, I went to Tizuru I learned how to use hot potatoes. And to me, that was so exciting. My gosh, not hot potatoes, it's just potatoes, right? But that time was so exciting. I went back and designed my class lesson using hot potatoes and started to teach everybody. That was how I started. And then I say, wow, there's hot potatoes. There must be other type of potatoes as well. Mm. Right, right. So uh, sharing, collaboration, and building. Yes, confidence. yes, yes. And of course, uh, okay, one thing about uh, teachers in school is that the senior teachers tend not to like to learn. And when the new teachers come in, sometimes they, they shy from learning from the young people. Mm. In fact, I think if you're an older teacher, you should not do that. Because I have uh, teachers training who go to schools and say that they were so excited with all sorts of ideas and they went to approach the teacher who is the head and say that I would like to introduce them to the, their older uh, staff members here. And they say, no, you're disturbing everybody, etc., etc. Mm. So learning from the young people who just come up from training colleges are very helpful too. Mm. 
because they have a lot of new knowledge as, as well. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's um, a nice place to end the interview. So, uh, everyone, please join me in giving a round of applause to Suning Tang. Okay, so we have some audience questions here. Um, so firstly, uh, what is the interaction between privacy and computer or internet use in Malaysia? In Malaysia, the privacy issue is a very sensitive issue, okay? Uh, our previous government used to uh, put people in jail when they, 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 they actually put anything on the internet that they consider is against the privacy of the people in the ruling party and etc. So currently, the new government is trying to be liberal and allow a lot of people to put lots of stuff online. So now the privacy issue is very blurred in my country. So sometimes you see things that are very sensitive being put online, which I felt shouldn't be put at all. And last time they censored too much, now they don't censor enough. So we are trying to actually figure out what's the best way to do it. Because last time there was too much control, now they are allowing everything to be put online and people are putting things that are not nice at all. So uh, that, that's the situation in my country now. Hmm. Okay, next question. Um, ah, okay, so instead of tricking students, is there a way to orient students honestly uh, to the purpose of the technology? Well, what you see the word tricking is negative, then it is negative. But it's actually not negative, right? We are tricked into so many things in life and we after that find that it's not a trick after all because it's something that enjoy. So if you want to change the word trick to orientate, I think it's okay also. If you, if you prefer it to be orientate, then it's orientate. Because let's say for example you introduce a new game, an uh, education game to the students and you say you trick them to learn it. But you can be, use a nice word and say you orientate them, right? So in that sense, uh, I think the, to me, it is a matter of interpretation. Uh, so, so I felt like orientation is actually the, the word to use if you want to be. Put it in the, how to say it, uh, uh, how to say it, course outline, for example, you don't say trick, you say orientate, okay? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so uh, a couple of related questions here. So the first one, um, is kind of a, a challenge. Uh, physics textbooks are not designed to be fun and exciting. Why do language teachers stress these aspects so much? Well, I would say that nowadays people try to make physics interesting and exciting too. I think that is a wrong concept. Okay, physics used to be very boring. When I was in school, it was very boring. I didn't know what the teacher was talking for the whole semester because it was so boring. But I can see that a lot of programs online about physics is so exciting. So I, I don't see that there must be a distinction between uh, content courses and language courses as far as making it interesting. I think both uh, content courses and uh, language courses should be equally interesting. Otherwise, the same thing will happen in school again, where people hate to go for content courses because it's no fun. Whereas uh, language courses are fun, but it should be both are equally fun. And uh, we are training our teachers to try to make them uh, make their physics class, the chemistry class, the uh, geography class exciting. So I, I, I don't see uh, why, why content courses are not interesting. So I'm answering it the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. <laughs> um, so a, a connected uh, question to that. Um, someone comments, uh, my students often comment that uh, games or learning technologies are too fun and they don't feel that they're learning anything. Um, so what balance between fun and study should technology strike in order to benefit students' learning? You say, you're saying that education games are fun? Uh, so it's um, saying that educational or learning technology um, is too fun, so it doesn't feel like learning, I think is the point. Ah. Well... Probably these students expect learning to be boring. So when they are introduced to technologies and games, they think, hang on, am I learning or am I just playing? But at the end of the day, if the students learned what you want or acquired or learned or have obtained the knowledge that you want them to gain, they have learned. So I think that is also called orientation of the student's mind into believing that when they're having fun, they are learning. Because old school of thought, when I was in school, class was boring, everything was boring, and that was what learning is about. 
So if you make your classes interesting and fun, at the same time, end of the day, the students learn what they are supposed to learn, that, that is what uh, education is about. So probably explaining to the students that, okay, at the end of the day, that you have learned all this. So these games are not just fun, you learn at the same time. So I think students should be aware of that as well. You know, because they always think that learning should be boring. Mm. Yeah, it's very much like my colleagues who wear a suit and tie to work every day, and I asked them why. They said, because if I wear something casual, I don't feel like I'm at work. Mm. I think maybe you should change your conception of what work yes, is. Yes, yes. And I think it's the same thing with uh, students too. Mm. And I think a good way of the teacher uh, getting the students involved in activities is first thing they say, okay, I'm going to introduce these games to you all. At the end, I hope you'll be able to learn some of these things. Because sometimes the student uh, uh, introduce games to them. They, they sort of lost what you actually want to teach them, okay? Because they think that this is for fun. And they, I'm not saying that they must all the time remember that there is a purpose behind it. But creating the awareness that there is some purpose in what they are doing will help them to actually see the purpose when they are doing the game. You see? If you don't create this awareness, they thought, oh, I'm just doing this for fun only. You see? But this is fun, yeah? But at the same time, you should learn A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so if you learn A, B, C, D, A, hang on, you have achieved both. You have fun and you have learned. Yeah. Okay, um, on a slightly different topic, um, one question here is asking about the call project that you described, which was a cascading model whereby yeah. some teachers uh, were trained and then they were asked to train other teachers, but they didn't do it. Um, and the person, uh, the question here is asking why not and what would have helped them to go out and train others? Right, uh, very interesting questions. I sure want to talk a lot about this, but I felt that uh, there's not enough time. Actually, I uh, took up a project uh, regarding to this smart school, and uh, I actually interviewed all the teachers in the smart schools in the urban area, there's uh, Klang Valley, and all these students were, in, uh, sorry, all these teachers were involved in this smart school project. Basically, the cascading process was they actually get all the teachers, let's say uh, 13 of them, and they call them the head teachers. So the head teachers are supposed to go back to the, they're supposed to attend these, these meetings whereby they learn the skills and whereby how to use the technologies. And then they go back to the school and they're supposed to have sessions where they share with the other teachers. And uh, after they go back, they would just share with the teachers. But I mean, it's like A learns from B. No, B learns from A. And so whatever knowledge B has acquired, he has to pass it to C. Right, of course, probably the knowledge has been diluted by the time it passed to C. So he passed his diluted knowledge to C. And diluted knowledge that the C part he passed to C, C is supposed to use it to implement whatever he's supposed to do in the, uh, in the classroom. And sometimes the teacher do not understand how to do it, so he asks back B. B says, I don't know, because that's what the person says. So it, it gets very confused because this, there is no follow-up, okay? There is no follow-up of, okay, you finish already, then you go back and there is a reference tutor that you can go back to and say, okay, what do you do? So in that sense, the cascading uh, method wasn't very successful. And then they are supposed to go to other schools as well as to tell them. So they find that, why should I bother? Because uh, it's not my job anymore, mm. see? Right, right, right. So, um, Mm. Oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, so this type of model is that there's a weakness to it. You, you expect the knowledge to be passed down like that, you see? Mm. Mm. Right, right, right. Um, so staying with the topic of teachers, um, one of the questions here is, uh, what do you do to maintain the well-being, and they've put in brackets, the mental health um, of the teachers who are resisting the use of technology in the classroom? Um, and they said, you, you mentioned a while ago that some of the teachers were angry, were not interested, were not satisfied, and so on. So I guess it's, um, you, you mentioned forcing before. I guess this is a, kind of a question about the ethics of forcing. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, I can immediately picture two teachers in my head, you know, who came to see me and uh, asked me why I have to do it, and both of them are very senior teachers. And they say that, uh, I'm not going to carry it out. I say, no, you have no choice but to carry it out. Everybody is doing it. There are 15 people and everybody is doing it, so you have to do it. Then she said, you have to give me all the guidance, etc. So mental well-being, oh dear, did I really think about the mental well-being? Mm, I just 
impose it on them and I of course told them that at the end you would thank me for it because you learn a lot of things that you don't know. And in a way they did, you know, because after they did the thing, they said they, they came to see me actually. Uh, in fact, they are quite good friends of mine now. Though at that time they were very angry with me. And they say, yeah, after you introduced that, I, because you know I interviewed and actually I published papers on them. If you go to, uh, you look for my name, you'll find some of the articles I published regarding this. And they say, yeah, at first I was very upset with you, very angry with you. And then after that, I realized that this is where, to, uh, where, I, where I should go. And after that, when the UCT imposed that everybody has to use online uh, software, online activities for their classes, they find that it was so much easier for them already because they already know how to do it already. So, so in that sense, I did not really worry about their mental health in the beginning, though I tried to tell them, okay, you try your best, but I gave them support. I gave them lots of technical support. I said that I have two technical support staff that you can call anytime. And I also gave them technical support in the sense of forum. So I say if your students have any problem, they can just put it into the forum and my technical support staff will answer the question. So mental support for them and also technical support for them. Not mental support in the sense of giving them a counseling session or anything like that, but I told them I will support them all the way. So the technical staff were very good, especially the weak teachers. They actually call the two technical support staff to go to their class for every session. For every stage of the way, they, they, they ask the technical support staff. Whereas many teachers did not. Many teachers just asked for session one, introduction. Then after that, they followed through themselves. But this one, every session, technical support staff was there. So in that sense, I think I took care of the mental health. I think so. Okay. Um, so we've got a question on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the question is, uh, above and beyond training and tech support, I'm keen to hear about accommodation of or innovations with regard to what you've called human factors. And I guess you've kind of mentioned that a little bit. Um, could you explain in a little more detail like specific interventions that you would use uh, to deal with the human factors of bringing in technology? Oh, those reluctant teachers you're talking about. Um, well, I think the reluctant teachers and also, um, I'm not sure from the question, but I think just uh, introducing technology in general, the kind of human factor. Well, the, the human factor, of course, the beginning we gave them a workshop where everybody attended. But the workshop was not very successful because you can see their face very blank, 50% of them. So after the workshop, I say that we have technical support staff who will take care of you and will be there for you all the time. So, and then I would say that guiding them all the way, providing them uh, support all the way, like little baby steps, heading, uh, so that they go in the right direction. You cannot just throw it to them and say that, find your way, swim or die, or something like that. So you, you, you have to give them support. And I felt that they were very grateful because I gave them all this support. And uh, if I didn't give this support, I think they would probably abandon what they were doing halfway. Mm. Okay, um, so changing topic a little bit. Um, as technology is constantly changing, how do you choose which technology or software to use in the classroom? Well, I, for me, I, those technologies that I use and they have been successful, I don't think there is a need to throw them away because there are new technologies coming. So as I use the technologies, I find that, hey, this is very good and I would repetitively use them because they are worth keeping and holding on to. And of course, when you come across new technologies and you want to dry them in the class, and sometimes you find it doesn't apply. So I would think that it is play by the year. If you feel that it works for one class, it might not work for another class. So, so in that sense, technology is very fun because sometimes you find it works for class A, but it doesn't work for class B. And then as you go along, you figure out what to do and what to do. And some of them are sensitive to certain technologies. They don't like it because it involves certain factors that they feel is uh, intruding into life, etc. Mm. Okay. Um, and we have another slightly challenging question here. Um, so, uh, this person is written in the first person. Um, I use technology in my classroom, and inevitably there are failures. I always have a non-tech plan B standing by, which is often just as effective. So, why bother with technology in the first place? <laughs> Well, this person hasn't told me what a failure is, for example, so I'm not sure what the failure is. Uh, maybe the person would like to tell us what failure is. Technical failure. Oh, well, 
Uh, that I agree with you 100%. Technical failure is something so unavoidable. Try using it when the with, uh, bandwidth is very low. Okay, and in rural schools, you come up with a, s a simple activity, but you find that the internet keeps hanging, there is no way out of it. And in that sense, if you are faced with that, you probably need to use a different device like a mobile phone or something, or uh, something that you can upload into your computer and use the non-technical, uh, something that you don't re need to refer to the Wi-Fi, you don't need the Wi-Fi, you don't need bandwidth. That's it. That's the only way out of it. it. Like, when I was in the rural school, it was not possible for the teachers to use technology at all because they have class of 40 minutes. They spend 20 minutes figuring out how to get things moving. And by the time it starts moving, it gets hanged after 5 or 10 minutes and you end up not doing anything for that 40 minutes. You see? So it's not worthwhile. And I would agree with it. It's not worthwhile here in that type of scenario. Okay. Um, and maybe just uh, one more question. This is from uh, Rob Scott. Where's Rob Scott? There we are. Okay, um, so this is a quote from Dr. Niwa, who is the former president of the Language Learning Association of Japan. Um, Dr. Niwa said, we should become masters of technology rather than being enslaved by it. We need to uh, establish our own teaching goals and then make use of technology to achieve these goals. How would you respond? master of technology and not enslaved by it. That's using big words, right? You think around the same thing. Master of technology, what, what do you mean you're master? When you sort of learn the technology, you're mastering the technology. But if you want to be the super master, like the Sinsen, the Sifu, Confucius, all these, I don't think you can do it. So enslaved by it, I gather you mean you become so engrossed in it and you use it for all purposes and when the, even when the bandwidth is low, you still endeavor to use it, then you became enslaved. Okay, you become a slave because you try too hard to make it work in an environment that doesn't work. But if you know what your environment is and you work, use it in a wisely, I think you become the master of it because you master the situation and I agree with you 100%, you have to be master of the situation because if you use a technology in a classroom, you're actually putting yourself to the test. Okay, you have prepared all these technologies and if your students are there and if the technology fails very badly, you look stupid. Okay, so in that sense, you have to be master of it. But not enslaved to the extent that you use it when it's not necessary. I always feel that that is very important. Use technology for the sake of technology. Something that you can do better by just telling people, talking to them, engaging with them, negotiating, interacting, you use technology and say, okay, I'm not going to talk, but this machine is going to talk to you. I, I think that it's being enslaved to the extent that you think the technology is better than you. I think at the end of the day, the teacher is still the master. Thank you. Mm, yeah, well, I think that's a nice place to end it. And um, so thank you everyone for the very interesting questions and thank you to Dr. Sumin Fang. Thank you for the very challenging questions. I hope I've answered them. Uh, I wouldn't say accurately, but uh, helpfully. And my apologies if I offended anybody. Thank you. <laughs>